Shay, so why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Shay. I'm a rapid prototype design, uh, designer, and I specialize in apps and web products for startups and ambitious entrepreneurs. Fantastic. Um, thanks, Shay. Um, so uh, can you uh, tell us uh, a bit about um, why would anyone want to create a prototype? What is the purpose of, of a prototype? So it's great that you're in development because development is the most expensive piece in building apps and web products. And what a lot of entrepreneurs don't know is development uh, costs at least three times over their initial budget. So in building a rapid prototype, it allows for you to validate your product ideas and test them with your target audience. And a lot of this process in particular is uh, the most important piece, but it's mostly skipped and people don't consider it. And it's actually the piece of their uh, puzzle that will save them a lot of time and money in producing a very expensive app or web product when they hire Alex. Got it. Uh, all right, so can you um, tell us a little bit more about what a prototype actually looks like and how does it differ from uh, the more sort of advanced versions that, that uh, get um, uh, developed later? So building rapid prototypes can get a little crazy because you have to trust the person that you decide to move forward with because you can't just trust anybody. Um, there's also different qualities. Uh, there's low fidelity wireframing where it's anyone can do it. You could draw it on a piece of paper and just like do little boxes or you could do have high fidelity wireframes where it almost looks like the actual product or you can even do a combination, which is what I do often most of the time. And part of my process is uh, uh, collaborating in Figma with my clients. So I'll do half low fidelity wireframes, half high fidelity wireframes. And then um, sometime in the process, we have these brainstorming sessions where we collaborate and uh, fill in the missing pieces because the way we think something could work may not be the right way to go about building it. And so that's when we figure things out together and we both understand the flow and make sure that um, everything I build is in alignment with uh, the founder's vision. Got it. So can you tell us a bit more about uh, what's important and what, what actually isn't? So you, you had those discussions with, with clients and um, you may decide to uh, develop some, some of the prototype using wireframes, others maybe using a pencil. So how do you make the decision and uh, what, what actually matters in a prototype? What, what has to be there and what can be skipped? It's really hard because I, I get a lot of entrepreneurs who want to make the next Facebook or the next Instagram and also intend to get funding by sponsorships and uh, uh, partnerships. But what I just described there is the hardest thing to do. Um, so the important thing to uh, know is like, do you have something that people want? And that's kind of where you start dipping your toes into like, do you have a product people want or an idea? And it's called product market fit. If you're not familiar for it, it's finding product market fit. Um, the most important feature is that one feature that will change somebody's life or that one feature that will solve a problem. And it's honing in on that very specific feature to solve a problem. Because you shouldn't be creating an app or a web platform or any of these products if you're not solving for a problem, because then you'll get down to the end of the line of building this out and it's beautiful, but then no one uses it. And that's the biggest problem in building uh, a new product is that you have to build something that people want. And typically what people want is something that changes their lives or solves it. And if you don't hone in on that one feature, you're gonna think, oh, I need those two to three other features. When you're first starting out, you don't need all those features. You have to start small and make sure that's so refined and then you build off of it. Because what you are doing is you're creating a solid foundation to build on top of it. Because uh, if you get big too fast, it makes it harder to pivot. And I'm sure a lot of you have worked in the industry where you run into a lot of different red tapes. Like you get so big, it, it gets crazy or you get so big, you ran out of money and you don't, you can't backtrack. So this is the part of the process that allows for you to build in a safer manner. Um, so hone in on that uh, number one feature and like a bad prototype is pretty much the opposite of that is having a high functioning prototype and it, it 
doesn't matter. You just wasted 128,000 on building an app that no one wants. Got it. I love it. So honing in on this one feature to solve the problem, um, so that so that we can uh, test if there's product market fit. C can you can you tell uh, tell us a bit about the challenges? So you kind of already mentioned that. So 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 honing in and avoiding sort of let's say feature creep, creating a lot of different things in in the app that that maybe aren't really the the key. Don't, don't address the key problem. What typically, what kind of challenges do you face uh, when you work with clients? Um, so product creep, uh, another word for that is uh, product, uh, scope creep scope. is what we call it here. Um, so you're asking um, how to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I, actually the question is more about uh, the different, the different challenges that you face from your perspective, because that was something I sort of figure out from what you said previously, but maybe uh, from your point of view, there, there's some other challenge that is more important. I think scope creep is probably one of the most um, important things, um, but also it's like do, doing your research. You're like It's super basic, and a lot of us think we do a right amount of research, but sometimes we don't. Uh, so doing the right research and validating your ideas is really well, but there's no easy to answer to this because you need to do the research and then you need to put something in front of an actual human being and then see how they respond to it and get ideas. But the trick is it gets tricky because you could put the product in front of the wrong person and get the wrong feedback and go in the wrong direction. So it comes also down with identifying your target audience. And there's just no easy way. There's just so many steps and so many things you have to take in consideration because you have to think like what you are trying to build at the end of the day, um, you have to think you're making an investment in time and investment in money. So you have to make sure that it's actually worth what you're doing because it will take time. Um, and all, the first year is all about uh, research and understanding and building that foundation. And there's another woman that I recently uh, learned about um, named Lindsay Tabas. She talks a lot about finding product market fit. And she does something that is in alignment with what I do and what I help my clients do is she doesn't uh, mind uh, marketing the product before it's actually a product. And there's pros and cons to this. Um, one of the hardest things about this is that marketing is crazy. Like you could get into marketing and go nowhere. Also, there's lots of um, strings to tie and elements to marketing is like, do you know the right message that you want to tell your audience? your value propositions, are you saying the right things? Are you looking the right way? So there, it gets complicated. But if you wanna validate your product before you uh, even go out and build it, um, you start marketing to your audience. And I'm sure everyone's read the four hour work week. Tim Ferriss does this in a way where he talks about um, putting up a web page, getting sale, as many sales as possible to see before he actually goes and prints those shirts. That's the same concept here is like you're, you're marketing your product on Instagram, you're seeing how much traction you can get. It's also a great way to validate um, your idea and then show it to investors, a great way to onboard your investors um, and have them buy into your idea. Because you, if you can get a solid email list of a thousand of like the same person um, really refined, then that's valuable. Um, and you can do a lot with that, but there's a lot of pieces um, in building building apps and web products that, that will be successful. Got it, this is great. So can you tell us a bit more uh, about the different tools and maybe examples of prototypes? So you mentioned Tim Ferriss already and his ideas. I, I read the book as well, 40 Hour Work Week. So for those of you who haven't, uh, definitely uh, rec recommend it. Uh, it's, uh, so, uh, so it's actually four hour work week, uh, did I get it right? Four hour work week, not 40 hour, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so what do you think would be the, the, uh, the recommended tools briefly that, that you would recommend basically for creating a prototype? And also, uh, can you, can you s uh, talk about some of the examples, maybe the ones that aren't confidential that you were, uh, that you worked on with, with your clients? Yes, absolutely. Do you mind if I also show a little um, four slides? I think this would actually be great. Uh, so let's let me actually give you co-host, and yeah. we could talk then uh, about uh, make co-host. There you go. You can you should be able to then share, and then you'll be able to show us basically what you have. We'll be able to talk about that. Okay. 
about to share. So we were talking earlier about what uh, low fidelity wireframes look like and what high fidelity wireframes look like. So I'm about to show you low fidelity wireframes and then a mixture of low and high. Um, so one of the main reasons why I build rapid prototypes is to get terrible ideas out of the way quickly and get you into early user testing. And part of that process looks like this. So it's, we have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I hear everything in your head and then I digest that. And I put that in a map like this. So those of us that are more logical um, or need it down on paper, like it helps us sort our ideas out way better. And now we have pieces we can move around and really figure out um, how to start. So this is a, an example of a low fidelity wireframe. And what we're looking at here is an Indonesian FinTech platform that created for J Jakarta millennials. Um, millennials that um, have never invested before, who are scared about, uh, timid about investing, don't know much and really need their hand held. So that was a little bit of the client brief for this project. Um, and we did a walkthrough and a game. It's very, very fun app at the end of the day. Um, and this is a little sample. I can't go into much more than this, but this is what the low fidelity wireframe looks like and just a little sample. Um, here's a lot of finished products that I've built and what they look like. I've done a lot of things from uh, meal, crop, meal prepping platforms, water saving apps, um, cannabis testing labs, <laughs> quarterback training coaching apps. I, I've, uh, I worked at a startup where we specialize in startups. So I've had all these um, opportunities to create products for different uh, types of startups, which is really amazing. And here's something that I'm actually working on. I did a little video recording. I'm just gonna click play real quick. You're gonna hear it very raw and unedited with my music in the background. Um, but this is a mix of something I've been working on for a game rewards app where it's a mix of, um, it's a mix of high fidelity and low fidelity. So I'm gonna start that. <laughs> You smiled at me and really eased the pain. Now the dark days are done and the bright days are here. My sunny one shines so sincere. Sunny one so true. What we're seeing now is the walkthrough. Sunny. Thank you for the sun. And now it's very fast. But this is what the onboarding process looks like. Half of it designed, half of it not designed. And what we're looking at is about one week's worth of collaboration. We've had three meetings so far in doing this and just getting them together, laying out different information, and just figuring out how it works. So that was my little um, video for something that I'm working on right now with half, half and half. Um, and the tools that I recommend are Figma. Figma is, I used to work in Sketch. I've worked in XD Design. I love Figma. Um, I'm sure the others have evolved since I last touched them, but Figma is a great app to collaborate between. Um, I, I don't know what part of the business you guys are in or what stage, but if you're a designer, if you have a designer, you can have your designer in there, but you can also be in there yourself and you can play around. It's a pretty intuitive app. Um, takes a little bit of a learning curve if you've never designed anything before, but it's a great way to just throw around shapes, move things around and really brainstorm and see what that idea looks like. So uh, that is all that I had to show. Excellent. Can you spell uh, the name Figma in the chat? Uh, for yes, everyone to see. Absolutely. Um, Figma. Okay. So, uh, somebody wrote, Maro wrote, uh, spelled it already. Maybe, maybe we already uh, have that. Um, so, one of the things I wanted to sort of clarify uh, with you so, the video that you created, that video itself is the prototype, right? It's underneath you have essentially screenshots. So you created like static images and you created the video from those static images. Did I get it right? 
Yes. Uh, so everything we're looking at static images, but also what's really nice about Figma is if you have a very uh, well built development team, you can pull code out of Figma. So it kind of creates a little bit of the gra uh, groundwork um, to keep everyone in alignment. Okay, got it. So that that video was created with Figma. Uh, is, is oh, the video the video itself was just screen recorded. Um, okay. But okay, got it. And it was created with Figma. Yes. Everything you saw today was made in Figma. Okay, got it. Uh, so uh, just to uh, another ask, ask another question. So at the beginning, you had this flow chart, basically. And you said you, you build that with your client. Uh, did I get it right? And that's a flow chart about uh, the kind of describes where what the user will do step by step. So if they do this, they go there. Is, is, that, is that what it? Okay, got it. And then you create essentially static images to, to uh, visualize each step. Uh, is that, that more or less? Oh, um, yes, what you're saying is right. So we do create these static images, but in the static images are all these little elements of buttons, text, words, section. And when you group them up, you can link different parts of them out um, to different pages, or you can animate them. Um, the best part about this is that click through where, so we, we started out seeing all my screens together. Uh, that was the playground that I play in. And then we click play to show the, the walkthrough, which is all the static images that you were speaking about. And that is where we can click link up different things. And I use that a lot for my user interviews and testing because I, I'll do a Zoom session like this and I'll record it. And I'll, I'll give um, the user the link and I'll watch how they navigate the website. And the idea is not to have the website fully furnished and like polished, but just enough to see where, um, how does the user digest all the information? Does it have the right marketing copy, the right story? And are they going to the places where I, ha I, I hypothesize they would go? Like, were my um, theories correct? Or, or do Got I it. need to? Got it. So the user can actually click through that app or website. Uh, and mm -hmm. when they click a particular button, they go to another screen. Uh, and uh, so underneath, um, I'm just, uh, what is important to me is what functionality is in there. So I assume that they can't, uh, for example, if they put something into a form that isn't going to be uh, actually saved anywhere. This... Okay. Uh, there are limitations and that is one of them. Um, so filling in input fields, so like your name, um, filling them out individually, the click through that you saw me uh, push us through, um, one of them was requesting a phone number and we didn't type in our phone number. We just clicked the next button. So you kind of have to role play or play along a bit um, for portions like that. So that is one of the limitations. Otherwise, if it did work, it might be fully coded by now. Okay, excellent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the stage for uh, uh, anyone. So. Uh, feel free to ask questions and uh, unmute yourself as well, or type it in, into the chat if you wish. Um, I have a few more questions, but uh, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing uh, comments from uh, all of you. If you had experience with prototyping, uh, how did you uh, do it? What worked, what didn't? What tools did you use? Uh, mm. Is there something you would recommend or not recommend? Um, or maybe if you had really clever ideas about how, how to prototype something. And, and really uh, in, uh, deliver like uh, this minimal viable product in a very brief way, uh, then, then feel free to share it. Um, uh, maybe let me ask a question uh, uh, initially about, about the trends. What do you think are the trends in the prototyping industry and, and um, what is changing? Um, I, one of the things I started seeing is I started networking a lot more and a lot of, other people are trying to enter the industry and create, if, if you've ever heard of Webflow, Webflow is um, the alternative to WordPress nowadays um, because of their CMS system. And Webflow is uh, really nice because it's an easy way to create a website um, and it's, it's doing pretty well in their industry. And what I'm starting to see is a lot of other um, entrepreneurs are trying to build products like Webflow, but for apps and uh, web, web platforms. Um, because Webflow right now only services websites, but these apps and web platforms, you can actually have downloadable um, apps um, I, on your uh, 
on, on your phone. And it's the alternative to, I think, Flutter. Um, if, could you correct me here if I'm wrong? I forgot what it's called, but it combines an Android code and it combines iOS code and it turns it into Java. Yes, that's correct, Flutter. Flutter, yeah. So I, it's a design version of Flutter is how I'm kind of seeing it in my head. I'm starting to see a few of those pop up. They're not, nothing great yet, but amazing progress is what I've seen. Got it, yeah. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, any anyone uh, courageous to add comments? Mark, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, just some general comments. Um, uh, first of all, Che, uh, yeah, quite interesting actually. You know, the few things, snippets of information there, very helpful and uh, yeah, nice impressive uh, slides and video there. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's just a few comments I wanted to add just to go over or expand on some of the things that you said really. Um, because I think the idea of prototyping in general is something that's changed over the years. I mean, I've been in the industry now for about 30 years, and the idea of doing like rapid prototyping 25 years ago is very different to prototyping today. Um, just a couple of things I made a note of is one of the biggest issues I find is working with non-technical founders, um, investors, people like this is that um, I'll just explain a little about this more in a moment, but what you can do in software is essentially create something that does a minimal use case, input, process, output. You can show something to uh, a customer, an investor, whoever on the screen, and they see in their mind something that works. Now, the point is that's a prototype in the same way that a model aircraft made out of wood is a prototype. So that, that wooden aircraft isn't going to go into a real aircraft. But in the same way, what's difficult with primarily software-focused products or services is that a customer or an investor can see something running and working in their mind. They say, oh, great, we tidy this piece, tidy that part, we have a product. It's not. It's exactly the same. It's a prototype that no part of that prototype goes into the finished product. And that's one of the kind of hurdle that I find speaking to people um, over the last uh, few years, certainly, is first of all, helping them to understand the distinction between something that looks like a product, which is in fact, no different to a, a balsa wood model of an aircraft. Um, I don't know whether that helps or not, but it's just a, an observation. Yeah, um, I think the portion of the process is, is very difficult because you don't know where they are and how, how much they've learned over the years. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I just find it helpful to be more explicit um, when I'm speaking to people initially that, you know, what I'm talking about or what I'm doing a demo of or what I'm planning to build, for example, is a prototype. It's not part of the finished product. It's a learning process, makes sure we're on the right track, gives us some ideas, etc. cetera. Um, it's interesting what you said about market fit as well, I think. I think that's probably the most important area is about understanding where the product's going and where it's going to fit mm. and kind of related to that also touches on when you talked about scope creep for example because it's one of the most important areas is identifying the most valuable use case or flow for example that's going to be in that product and this is where you can help to limit you know the features and to avoid doing things that aren't needed especially in a software system, if you're going to demo something that's knocked up in, it could just be some simple shell scripts, for example. There doesn't necessarily need to be a user interface if the actual value is in producing a certain type of data. And if you're doing that with some shell scripts, for example, you don't need to worry about doing, you know, a, a login process or, you know, something like a charting process. You can just show, you know, that the, the, transformation, you know, parsing format, uh, not necessarily formatting, but the value added processing of data to show the end result, to see the numbers as in a prototype, put it in a CSV, put it in Excel, and you've got a table of data that actually gives you information that you never had before. So it's that side of thing that helps to narrow the scope of what you, you're trying to work on. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. That was it, really. I just wanted to just go over my experience and what I've seen, and you know, I certainly agree with you. There's some the one thing I did notice, um, 
actually let's actually Mark, your... maybe let me let's let's uh, Jay respond to that before i start uh, yeah sorry yeah yeah let's uh, Jay, do you have okay. to um data is great um if you can build a prototype without actually building anything that's the best way to go about yeah. it yeah. um there's a um re car rental delivery app and some guy said I handed this to a random customer in Home Depot parking lot and said, press this button um, if you need help or call this number if you need help or text it, some, something where he did some, like texted and the man who gave him the phone received it. And then he shows up and helps him and they drive off. And then the guy gives his phone number to all these new people. And then it shows like a demand for this product. Like that's a really simplified version of a longer story. Um, but if you can also build a prototype that way, that's a different way of collecting data. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it is about just focusing on that main successful use case. Sometimes people get carried away and try to build in, you know, some kind of authentication, security, or, you know, a charting feature, for example. One yeah. thing um, I've... I, Mark, I uh, before, before I get to it, I wanted to just respond to one thing because there's a question on the chat. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll stop. I'll stop uh, now. Sorry, guys. Uh, uh, from Maru about recordings, uh, I uh, actually... Uh, I am recording it, but I have a backlog of uh, videos to actually publish. And uh, I hope that today I would actually announce the channel, but we haven't actually finished. So literally within a few days, uh, all the four previous videos are going to be available. And this one probably within a few days. It took some time to set it all up and, and set up the, the process around it and so on. Uh, but it will it will be it will be soon available soon. Uh, so that's that's the answer. Mark, uh, why don't you why don't you uh, ask your your other question? Because you uh, I interrupted you for the second time and uh, go. It's on. not a problem. I get carried away talking sometimes, and my apologies for my very strong uh, Cockney English dialect. I, I forget that sometimes. Uh, <laughs> if you find it difficult understanding me, please tell me. And I will try to speak uh, more clearly. <laughs> um, no, I think I got to where I was. The one kind of query I think I had was um, you talked about low fidelity and high, and high fidelity, um, Jay. Um, do you make the distinction then between low and high as in a low fidelity? For I'm trying to relate you to my terminology that I've used in the past. Um, so a low fidelity, for example, could be as simple as something drawn on paper as an example of layout for screens, uh, whereas high fidelity would be like a mock-up with the, the right type of decoration, for example. So I, is that correct as in, as in your, your definition of high and low fidelity? So one is just an, yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect, yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, Roy, I, you turned your camera on. I just think, or did you have a question maybe uh, that you wanted to? By the way, for, for all of you, if you uh, could please turn your camera on, that would be great because this this part of the of the meetup is about uh, you know discussion and uh, we want to see your faces. I want it to be interactive, so uh, please please turn your cameras on. Um, uh, Roy, did I did I understand it correctly or not? Uh, I I no no pressure no pressure by the way I don't want uh, anybody to feel pressured to speak either. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm good. Uh -huh. I'm kind of a little late, so I'm uh, so maybe I had question later when we you are talking we are discussing. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. All right, so uh, in that case, actually I, uh, I have a question. Uh, go on. So, yeah, so. Uh, I would like to understand because as far as I understood it, it is like you are working for a client to show him this. You are trying to figure out how they would like this application to work and doing these diagrams and then turning it to this, these um, prototypes. And how does that go to uh, like measuring the impact and, and, and checking if it works or not with the customer? actual end customers, how does that part work? Um, so I haven't found anyone who offers a process how I offer mine, but I include, uh, so I start out with workshops and figuring out what it is and digesting what they want. And then I do half the prototype 
And then I dip into their network of who they think their target audience is. And that's when I start interviewing people. And when there's a large budget to the project, I like to interview at least nine people because um, some of the people that they think might be a good fit, I may not and vice versa. So that's when we discuss different types of users because, and one of the things I said earlier is if you put your product in front of the wrong user and get the wrong feedback, you're going in the wrong direction. So it really helps to interview the right person. And, and that's where I do like a combo. And I do, um, if you've ever watched Y Combinator, they like to do two week sprints. And I like doing a one week sprints for smaller goals. So I'll do a one week half prototype, half user testing. And then I'll do another where, where it's kind of similar. And it depends on how long, um, how much time I have and what the budget is though. Okay, so you are you are getting like nine potential customers and mm -hmm. like interviewing. So you are showing this part of this first mm -hmm. first iteration of the of the prototype. And then what happens then? Like okay, they say that they like it, and then you are doing the next iteration of the prototype. How does it? Or so, or is it just that then you say okay, this this uh, product is is good, and let's try to make it or. Uh, this one's a uh, bigger question to digest because I help them get off the ground. I help them get out the really um, obvious errors I see, obvious errors other people see to where they have something that works really well. But as a growing business, you're, you're gonna have to reiterate over and over over the years because if you look at Airbnb, we've seen their website change so many different times. If we look at Facebook, Facebook's changed. So you're always improving upon the product and you keep changing it over time. So I help them in the beginning stages to accomplish a very specific goal. Oh, of course, of course. I mean, just, I, I don't care about the next life cycle, the whole life cycle of just from the prototype to the actual MVP that will be on production and will be used. Mm -hmm. So what are like the stages there between, like you are showing the next versions of the prototype to the same clients, how does it work? Okay. Um, the stages, so, a workshop is a stage and I do three workshops. I do a bare bones branding foundation where if you don't have a brand, I do that just to understand what your five term goals are and account for that. Um, MVP features workshop, user persona workshop. Um, I call it a Ray workshop. It's revenue efficiency and awareness workshop. Um, and then that's when I do that. You saw that bubble chart if you were on earlier, the orange one and the green one where we it's like a site map. Um, so that's the second part of the process. Third is wireframing user interviews. And then there's at least like one to three weeks of that. And then they have something that they can take and show around. Okay, thank you. And you, you have, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. That, that's okay. really interesting. And you have oh, just one more thing. You only also said about the, that you are creating like an ad first and go to the Instagram, for example, with the complete ad. Oh, it's marketing. The, uh, before yeah. you have a product. That yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I highly recommend Googling Lindsay Tabas if you want to learn about that more. I love that can she you, Can you spell her name in the chat as well? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I can post her link. Oh, lindsayt.com. So that link is now in um, Zoom. But she talks, if you download her ebook, she talks a little bit about that. And I love it because. Um, I, I helped one of my clients in particular do that. And he's pivoted um, on, he's on his second pivot because he recognized uh, his audience was pulling him in a different direction. So I, I recommend it, but also it's, um, it's a high risk if you do market before you have a product. So be careful with how much money you spend. Thanks. Interesting. Yeah, this is, this is great advice. Um, so I, I think we can take one more question before we go to break out the rooms. And I saw a very interesting uh, comment actually uh, uh, from uh, Maru, uh, which is that there is a huge difference between an MVP and a prototype. Unfortunately, these often get used interchangeably, which is misleading in product strategy. And then Mark responded, uh, yep, yeah, for me, Prototype is to learn what to build and MVP is the minimum build once you know. Uh, what do you think, Che? What's the difference between the two? I think that's a really good point. I think I might get that mixed up sometimes because I think what I do is I do do rapid prototyping 
I create maybe the MVP before the development MVP, if anything. But I feel like as we evolve, terms do change. Um, because just having something you can put in front of somebody, like that helps. And even if it's paper, you could still call that an MVP. So I know the term gets a little wishy-washy. Um, but I would say you guys are both right. The MVP is probably more developed with development and code. And what I'm doing is not that. So um, there, I, I agree to some extent. And um, terminology, is, yeah. Mark, do you, you have a, have a good one? Yeah, I just wanted, because I've had quite a few not necessarily arguments, but heated discussions about this. And there are so many acronyms around uh, product development with MVP, MMP, and there's a dozen others. MLP, minimal lovable. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think that for me, and the way that I always remember the difference, and to me, there is a specific difference. If you look at the definition of prototype in almost any dictionary, it's a way of learning and understanding before you actually commit to building a product, regardless of how big that is. Whereas MVP and MMP, et cetera, is blah, blah, product. So yeah. it's, it's a product that's being built. An MVP is a minimum viable, argue about semantic definitions of between MVP and MMP. But for me, it's a P standing for product, which makes a difference. So it is a product and it's something that will if not now, at some point be sold, whereas a prototype is not. A prototype is for learning and understanding. In my mind, I'm not okay. necessarily correct. <laughs> That's yeah, my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Okay. I yeah, I, I uh, look, I, uh, I'm i going to actually um, continue this rather than going to breakout rooms because we're a fairly small group and I can see two people raising their hands. So let's, let's, let's go on. I think, Mari, you raised your hand uh, first. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself, even if you don't have video working. Uh, uh, I, I was just about to leave a meeting. I, I got to leave on a short notice, but I'm going to try to make it very concise. Um, um, I, I worked in strategy for the past 10 years, and it, that involves also setting up organizations so that they are able to produce um, innovation in the form of product, which is a new paradigm of thinking for various reasons, but that's, that's a totally different topic. Uh, but, and, and there is a huge confusion about what an MVP is. An MVP doesn't even have to be a product. It's the validation of a value, uh, um, value component that you want to um, roll out into the market, and you want to make sure whether or not this is a, a meaningful way to go. A prototype is an extremely valuable way once you have defined an idea, uh, about what you want to actually build, and that make, helps you even get any process, meaningful process of uh, of of iteration started because without a prototype you don't even know what you're talking about it's all empty words on a on a wall and it's all too easy to get stuck in those things on a, on a even if the boards are fancy in kanban or some nice powerpoint slides it's absolutely useless um maybe it can help you get some data from the market etc but it's by far not as good as a prototype and i think that's undervalued just because people follow hypes and that's our nature as a human being psychologically we follow the shiny new thing and MVP has been sadly, very, very sadly misunderstood, particularly amongst the big and many troops of consultants. And unfortunately that does a great disservice to the clients because they invest a lot of money and time and leading their people in, in a way that doesn't, that most of the time leads to a lot of frustration because they don't see the point. And I don't wanna go on a tangent again about four or five new topics. I'm gonna stick to this. And that's the point behind my short remark in the chat. Okay, so, thanks, Barry. Mm -hmm. It's it's a shame you have to go because we could have continue the discussion because uh, I think it's a very interesting one. Uh, I think uh, Che, do you have do you have uh, a comment on this before I go to the next question? Um, I think what you shared is great. I actually want to go write a blog about it because I think you. Uh, sometimes I think as humans we don't challenge things, or sometimes we're running so fast we forget to take a step back. I think uh, you're very right. I think they're two different things. Um, it's very hard um, to know when uh, what you're talking about sometimes if you're a client who knows nothing. So I agree. Okay, great. Uh, Deepak, I saw you raising your hand. Uh, uh, what's your question or comment? Direct question is how often the prototype needs to be changed, like, mm -hmm. like, and completely change versus like little bit change. Is that making sense? Yeah. Um, the best thing about the prototypes I build are their actual files that they can take. And then 
um, they can design with over the years and uh, plug and play. Uh, prototypes types change pretty much every day. Um, everyone's going to want to change them over time. Got it. So Thank nice you. All right, any more comments, questions? Um, I actually have a question, uh, a general one. Chait, is there anything else we haven't discussed that you'd like to share with the group? I want to know about your um, MVP um, experiences or your, your web platform experiences. Um, Deepak, uh, sure. Thank OK, you. it's just that. Uh, We've been making, means uh, I'm like full stack developer. Uh, we've been making some uh, initial development for two, three days and show to the client. And it takes lots of, lots of, lots of discussion uh, based on the client's knowledge. Uh, like what, what, what experience client is having in using the software or certain newbie. So that's, that's where it is like, so, so sometimes we spend 15 days and client says, no, we don't need this one. So that happens a lot, but or after having experience, I think uh, we are, we know what client needs. And again, it, de it depends on the domain. So if we are into insurance, we know, we, we have the knowledge, but if you ask me to make a, a prototype in banking and no one in my team is having experience, then that's a different a different story. Yeah. There's a lot of egos in place when it comes to entrepreneurship and building your own business because we love well, our babies. They are our babies. I have an ego, all of us have an ego on here and Everyone wants their hand held at some point. Nobody wants to be made to look stupid. So if they don't know something, you need to educate them in the proper way or create okay. a process for them to follow and understand and a way for them to collaborate. Um, if you've ever read um, How to Win Friends and Influence People or haven't read it, I highly recommend it because um, if you're a business owner or a tech lead, you have to guide somebody with respect into your process and then uh, get their trust. Because if you tell them, no, this is what you need, they're gonna pull back and they're not gonna wanna listen to you. Yeah, um, uh, in, in initial days, we, uh, we realized that, but now as we get experience and we are learning a lot, so we are like open and you are right. There, there is some egoism part, which really we want to, okay, stick to this, you know? But yeah, I understand that, thank you. To trust you like a friend um, for you to make recommendations that go against what they think. Hmm. Got it. We have a question uh, from Mardi uh, on the chat. Is a prototype a part of agile? Uh, is it a part of an agile cycle or is it uh, just a jump start? So what's really the relationship between, between prototyping and, and agile development? I uh, direct this question to you. I think you'd be more suited for it. Um, I always get this confused. Um, I've, I started out as a designer and who developed on the side. I never actually studied to be UI UX designer. Um, so I've fallen into this role and I've had to learn as I go. Could you answer this for me? <laughs> well, I can try. I mean, from my point of view, uh, I think that prototypes uh, and MVPs can definitely be developed as part of the standard agile cycles. I don't see them as anything separate. Uh, that's that's my opinion. Uh, and uh, I believe they can be managed the same way, you know, using either Kanban or Scrum. And that's how I would do it. Uh, I, I don't see a reason why not. Uh, and uh, we, we could use the same processes. As, as we do for software development. So if you're using Scrum, you could use burn down, burn down chart to track progress. Uh, if you're using Kanban, you can use work in progress limits. All of that fits. I, I don't see reason to create any, any other process than what, what you use for development for this. Anybody has a different opinion on this? Are you no, guys I would just agree with you actually, Alexander. There's no reason why not, you know, it's, and it doesn't necessarily have to be agile, you know? It, in, in certain industries, you might need to do a little bit more of a kind of, not so much strict waterfall, but you know, if you're working in like hardware development, for example, you would still need to do a prototype, but you would need to do it in a much more structured way with a little bit more upfront work before you can start to 
go into any kind of uh, prototyping on even a breadboard, for example. But yeah, there's no reason why you can't do prototyping as part of an agile process or any other kind of software development framework or process, as long as you set what the targets are. And if you're using an iteration or increments or as Alexander says, Scrum Kanban, Scrum Ban, you know, whatever stepwise refinement, it, as long as you have that kind of understood by everybody involved, there's no reason why not, I don't think. Okay, great. My uh, opinion, actually, obviously. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned hardware prototyping. That's that's something we, we didn't discuss. I mean, kind of uh, intentionally wanted to focus on software and software, uh, in particular, yeah user level software, uh, software with, with GUI basically. Yeah. Because indeed hardware prototyping is uh, a somewhat different, uh, yeah. uh, different, a different, I uh, can't remember the phrase in English. Yeah, I'm certainly no expert. I've, I've touched on it, but no expert for sure. On right. the hardware side. Um, all right. Uh, any other comments, questions? Um, I uh, I could I could share actually uh, some observations, some interesting stories about. Uh, you may have heard this story about Dropbox, uh, the prototype or MVP, how how you want to call it uh, for Dropbox was merely, uh, I think, a video or screenshots, right? It was not working software. It was uh, completely imagined, so to say, at this point that it would be. Um, at, if, as a synchronized, seamless integration uh, that would allow you to, to, to copy files. Uh, and, uh, and it worked. And, and the guy gathered significant funding based on just that, uh, basically visualization of how it will work. So that's, that's definitely uh, a, an important way to, to validate the idea and also to present it to investors. Um, uh, Piotr, uh, you, you're raising your hand. Yeah, yeah, just wanted to, to ask one, one more thing. Do you, when you're doing the prototypes, do you do also some kind of A-B testing that you're doing two different prototypes and showing two different clients and do stuff like oh, with that? With my process? Uh, no, just because uh, I have a lot of clients that hire me for um, getting things done quickly um, and efficiently. So I only have so much time um, for those projects to only do one version of them. So the interviewing the users part is kind of like the A-B testing, because then I iterate all those changes from each meeting. Mm, okay, okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. Uh, thanks. Uh, I see uh, actually two more questions. Uh, that these may be the last ones um, from Deepak. Uh, Chai, when you and your team makes a prototype and the client accepts it, and when the development team does not deliver the application on time. Uh, if the client comes back to you, how do you handle that? Um, you have to hire a good team from the get-go and create trust with your team. Um, and I like working with people I can communicate well with. So if they know there's like development, there's always problems. Um, but a good development lead will know uh, when those problems will happen before they happen. And that all comes with, down to communication. You have to it's better to receive bad news earlier than later. Um, so I hope that helps. Yeah, great. <laughs> and a comment, uh, a question actually from Bill. Um, uh, Bill, anyone done prototyping with an RPA package and RPA stands for robotic process automation. Um, I have to say, I haven't done any and it's, it's, it's an interesting field like Mar Mark uh, wrote. Um, does anybody have experience on that? Uh, che, do you? Uh... I would love to hear someone chime in if they do. Yeah, I think I, I totally agree with this. This is a huge field that um, uh, is, is currently seems to be growing, especially due to AI uh, from what I see. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a, a very interesting one. Um, okay, so I think we're uh, uh, approaching the end.